Hello, everyone, and thank you for coming. Um, I'm excited to introduce Jean Sauvage of Gluten Free Baking for the Holidays. And thank you, Jean, for coming. So thank you very much for having me. I'm honored to be here. Um, let me get a sense of who here is gluten free themselves. OK, it looks like a good majority. And how many people are here just because they, they either have friends and family who are gluten free or they're just interested in the topic? OK, great. Thank you for coming. Um, so I wrote a book on, or a cookbook on gluten free baking, specifically gluten free baking for the holidays. And I call my journey to getting to this point the road to deliciousness. So um, because one of my goals with gluten free baking is to make things that taste and feel good. Um, there's no point in baking if it's gross, really. Um, so I wanted to give you a, a, a little taste of why I wrote a book about gluten-free baking, how I got here. And um, so to give you a little bit of my history, I was diagnosed uh, as gluten intolerant after the birth of my daughter in 2000. And apparently that's very common. Um, autoimmune disorders are often triggered by a body trauma. And a body trauma can be something like pregnancy, childbirth, um, a very bad cold, um, a car accident. And so the more I talk to people who are gluten intolerant, the more I realize that this trigger point is very common uh, with a lot of people. Now, with me, I was completely shocked by the entire thing. I had no idea that this was possible. And, um, but the more I thought about it, the more I realized that my funny tummy my whole life made a lot of sense, actually. And um, so I'm one of those people that my entire life, even before my diagnosis, I always uh, felt bad when I ate something. So I had um, a stomach ache, diarrhea, bloating, the whole nine yards. And this happened every time I ate. And every time I went to a doctor, they would just say, oh, well, I guess you just have a funny stomach. So just be careful with it. And that really wasn't that helpful. <laughs> Um, and also, I spent a whole lot of my life just feeling bad, which isn't great. Um, does this story sound familiar to anybody? OK, so this is actually something. There is some statistic out there that once you start on the road to trying to figure out what's wrong with your system um, when you're reacting to gluten, it's something like 12 years from starting the search for the reason to the actual diagnosis. And I think the reason for this is a lot of doctors up until now have been trained that gluten intolerance is so rare that there's no point in even looking for it. it, it it's so rare it doesn't exist. So they didn't even think of it as an option. So my whole life, I've never had a doctor talk about gluten. I don't even think. I knew what gluten was until I was diagnosed. Um, so my first question of my doctor, and it may be your first question as well, is what is gluten? Because they kind of say, oh, hey, you can't eat gluten. Bye-bye. And I thought, OK, but I don't know what that is, and you need to help me with this. So after my diagnosis, I realized I had to know what gluten was, and I also had to know where it uh, resided in our food system. So let's see. Great. So I want to tell you a little bit about what gluten is. You may or may not know this. Gluten is a protein. Um, actually, it's a combination of two proteins that is found. Uh, the two proteins are gliadin and glutenin. And these two together make up the thing we call gluten. They're found in all forms of wheat. And that includes spelt, camet, farro, durum, emmer and icorn. So I don't know if you guys have experienced what I've experienced, but I often go places and they say, oh, here's a gluten-free thing. It's spelt. And I have to say, no, that's a form of wheat. So you have to be really careful about the lack of knowledge on the part of the food industry. Um, it's also found in rye, and it's found in barley. And then it's also found in something called triticale, which is a combination of rye, of, uh, rye and wheat. There's a lot of question about oats. And if you have been gluten-free for any amount of time, you know about the concept that you need to eat gluten-free oats. Um, and 
oats themselves can be problematic for people who can't tolerate gluten. So there's a prolamine in oats that mimics the prolamine in gluten, which is called gliadin. The prolamine in oats is called avenin. And avenin is something that people who are gluten intolerant often are intolerant to as well. So if you don't tolerate gluten, there is a good chance that you actually don't tolerate um, avenin or oats. Um, if you do tolerate oats, you, if you're a gluten-free person, you need to make sure that you buy gluten-free oats. As you may know, um, oats are often processed and grown with wheat, so you need to make sure that you don't get the cross-contaminated uh, oats. Okay, so another question I get a lot is, what are the forms of gluten intolerance uh, in, in um, sensitivity, allergy, there are all sorts of words that are floating around out there. The main thing that people seem to know about is celiac. Celiac is an autoimmune disorder, and it is caused by um, the, what happens is your body, if you're prone to it, your body will attack itself uh, once you eat gluten. How many people here are actually diagnosed celiac? Okay, so we have a few folks. Um, there's also a non-celiac gluten intolerance. This is where you're not celiac, but you're still reacting to gluten. This category encompasses a few things because they're not entirely clear what the mechanism is. So if you're not celiac, but you react to gluten, they call it non-celiac gluten intolerance or sensitivity. Um, different doctors call it different things. There's not a whole lot of information out there on this, but it's kind of just the category that they lump people into if you're not actually celiac. And what non-celiac gluten intolerance is, is you are not autoimmune to um, gluten, you're just reacting to it. There's also a thing called wheat allergy, which is a little bit different. It is when, you, when your body mounts a, a histamine reaction to wheat, and you can actually go into anaphylaxis if you eat wheat. It can range from mild uh, to very um, uh, strong of a reaction. You can go in, in, like I said, you can go into anaphylaxis and you can die if you have a really strong allergy. There is no such thing really as a gluten allergy, they don't think, but there is the wheat allergy. So that's something to keep in, keep in mind. So I just wanted to give you a sense of who reacts to gluten in the United States. So you probably have heard the one in 133 people in the United States they think has ce have celiac, which is about 1% of the population, and that's about 3 million people. Now, celiac is a, ge is a genetically predetermined disease. So you need to have the, the genes for celiac in order to develop celiac. And they think about 30% of the population, or 94 million people in the US, have the genes for celiac, which is kind of intense. Um, and you don't necessarily develop celiac if you have the gene. That's the strange thing. It needs to be triggered on some level. So since I am celiac, we test our daughter, who is now 13. We test her every few years. Uh, for um, the, gliadin the gliadin antibodies, just to make sure she hasn't um, been triggered and is now full-blown celiac, because we don't know if she got the gene or not, but there's a good chance she did. Then there's another 5% of people, which is 18-plus uh, million people, who have the gluten intolerance that's non-celiac, um, and they think it's way more than that. They think this is a very conservative estimate. And then there's a 0.5%, which is about 1.5 million people in the US that have a weed allergy. So that just gives you a sense of the amount of people that are out there reacting to gluten. Um, and it's a lot. They think these numbers are very conservative um, and that we will see more and more and more people that are statistically diagnosed with these things. So when I was first diagnosed, I went through a pretty huge mourning process. I imagine this is pretty um, familiar to folks in this room. Um, I ate gluten all the time before I was diagnosed. I had toast and cereal for breakfast. I had sandwiches for lunch. I had pasta for dinner. I had scones and cookies and treats throughout the day. And all of a sudden, I was told, you can't eat any of those things. And I was just devastated. Um, and I had a new baby, so I didn't quite know what to do because I was used to just making a a quick sandwich and all my all our friends were dropping off meals for us and of course all those meals had gluten and the hospital even sent us home with a meal which was lasagna and I couldn't eat that so it was <laughs> kind of a disaster for me and I've talked to a lot of people who feel the same way it's just 
It's very hard to get diagnosed with such a huge food allergy or intolerance, especially if it's something that is part of your diet all the time. And this is very common. Most people are diagnosed with a food intolerance or allergy to something that they eat a lot. That's kind of sort of how the body works. It gets triggered by, by constant um, repetition. So one thing that happened to me is I didn't know how to eat, so I just stopped eating. So I lost all my pregnancy weight in about three weeks, which is kind of an intense thing. And then you've got a baby, and it just wasn't a very fun situation for me. Or my, my husband, he didn't know what was happening because he had a wife who was sick all the time, and we had a new baby to deal with. and. So I just kind of sort of went into mourning. I just thought, well, I'll never eat gluten again, and that's just the way it is, and um, I just am going to have to deal with it. And that actually wasn't all that satisfying, but that's what I did for a little while. Even worse was that I had to stop baking, or I felt like I had to stop baking. I'm someone who's a lifelong baker. I baked from the time I was tiny and I could climb up onto a stool and get onto the kitchen counter and access the cupboards in order to get the ingredients to bake. I mean, literally, I baked throughout childhood, I baked throughout college, I baked throughout grad school, uh, I also baked as an adult. and. It just, I realized through this diagnosis, actually, that baking is kind of the through line to my life. It's my passion, it's my joy, it's my stress reliever. And so the concept that I couldn't bake anymore was even worse than not being able to eat gluten anymore. Or, and I thought I couldn't bake anymore. I, I realized later that I could, but in the beginning, it just felt horrible. So you go through a mourning period where you just feel like, Gluten has died, and you can never talk to it again. And then you have to pick yourself up by the bootstraps eventually and relearn how to eat. And I had to relearn also how to bake. And then you get on with life. And I've known several people who tend to get stuck in the fact that they can't eat the thing anymore. And I just realized, for me, that wasn't that helpful because it just made me feel bad all the time, emotionally bad. So I just thought, you know what? I'm going to figure out how to eat again and also how to bake again. And that actually has turned into something that's very satisfying for me. So one thing. Gluten, as you may know, comes from the Latin word for glue. And that's a really good uh, description of gluten because when all else fails, gluten is very sticky. Now, gluten performs a lot of functions in baking. In fact, modern baking is based on how to manipulate gluten to do what you want it to do. So you take gluten away, you have a really tough time actually baking anything. So one thing I had to do was learn what gluten did. And what it turns out, gluten performs several functions in baking. It's a binder. It holds things together, hence the, na the, the glue name. Um, and a lot of gluten-free things are crumbly because they don't have the appropriate binder. It's a structure builder. And what I mean by that is gluten serves as like the tent pole structure that the starches adhere to that create a covering that then the leaveners can work on to raise the baked thing. So if you don't have gluten or a replacer for gluten, you now have a very flat thing. And I don't know about you, but I have run into a zillion gluten-free baked things, like, I don't know, scone and muffins, that are kind of like hockey pucks. They're very dense, they're very um, uh, heavy, and um, they're very crumbly. And that is due to the binding and then the structure building being not there. Uh, the other thing that gluten does is it's elastic. So it allows you to manipulate it. So you know when you make a, a loaf of artisan bread, you can form it on a cookie sheet and it'll keep it, you can stretch it to its shape, but then you can let it stay there and it'll keep its shape. Without gluten, things don't keep their shape. First of all, stretching it doesn't really factor into it because you're just basically spreading it around and then it just blobs out. So I don't know if anyone's tried to make a bread with a gluten-free dough, but um, it's very difficult. You need a structure like a, pan, a loaf pan in order to do that. Then gluten also is a moisture retainer. It helps, um, it helps things retain moisture. This is why a lot of gluten-free things are very dry. I don't know if you've experienced that, but a lot of gluten-free things are dry, um, like 
Again, I just think of hockey pucks. They're flat and dry and crumbly, and it's because there's, a, there's no moisture retainer in there, which is what gluten does. And then gluten also extends the shelf life, so that's related to the um, moisture retaining properties. So when you bake gluten-free, you need to find something that, that serves all of these functions, that does all of these things, and this is the challenge for gluten-free baking. So in gluten-free baking, we have to choose what I call a gluten replacer. And a gluten replacer is the thing that hopefully does all of those things I talked about. Um, there are several that people use nowadays. There's a thing called xanthan gum. There's guar gum. There's also seeds, ground seeds, psyllium, flax, chia. There's pectin, and there's also gelatin. There's a lot of um, controversy in the gluten-free baking world about which one you should use and which one's easier to use and which one works the best. And my experience has shown me that xanthan gum actually performs most of the functions pretty well. Uh, the one function that it doesn't perform that well in, but none of them really do, is in the elasticity part. It's still hard to get things that to mold things without them being dry. And um, that's something I'm still working on. But what all of these things are, they fall into a class of things called hydrocolloids. And what that means is they're moisture retainers. So they can um, retain hundreds of times their own weight in water, which is interesting. And so each one of these things you can use in a gluten-free baking product to serve as the uh, gluten replacer. And what I mean is you mix this with the flours, and now you've got a thing that will mimic gluten, uh, a gluten flour. Now, in terms of choosing flours, I thought initially that all I needed to do was choose a flour, add some xanthan gum, and I'd be good to go. I, that would be easy. And it turns out it's not that straightforward. It turns out there's no one gluten-free flour that behaves like wheat flour, which is what I wanted to mimic. So I had to ask some questions of myself, and I think all bakers need to ask these questions of themselves, which is, what kind of baking do you want to do? Do you want to do whole grain baking? Do you want to do grain-free grain baking? Do you want to do paleo, which is grain-free, sugar-free, sometimes dairy-free? Do you want to do healthy baking, whatever that means? Um, or do you want to experiment with flowers? Do you think the flowers taste good and you want to kind of experiment with different things? I came down to what I wanted to do was create items that were indistinguishable from their wheat counterparts. Um, and this, I think, is what distinguishes me from a lot of gluten-free bakers in that I work on making things that everyone is going to want to eat, gluten-free and gluten-full, um, because they taste so good and they're indistinguishable from the things that they normally get. So again, I thought, OK, I figured this out. Now I need to figure out how to do the flowers. And it turns out with gluten-free baking, you need to mix flours. No one flour will really do what you need it to do. And so you need to mix flours in order to uh, mimic the performance of wheat. And what I did was I chose a flour mix that I thought I, that I liked and spent several years tweaking it to, um, to perform the way I wanted it to perform. And um, so what I did was I looked at the things that I wanted it to do. So first of all, I found that all-purpose wheat flour consists of 80% starches and 20% gums and protein, which is kind of a weird combo. Um, wheat flour does have um, gums in it. And so I wanted to mimic that chemistry. I wanted it to taste good, so I didn't want it to taste like bean. I don't know about you guys, but a lot of people use bean flour, and that has a very strong taste that I didn't want to put into my baked goods. Um, I wanted it to have a good mouthfeel. I wanted it to be allergen-free. So the mix that I came up with doesn't have any of the common allergies. It doesn't have soy, corn, nightshades. Um, which are all th nuts, and these are all things that people in my world reacted to, and I wanted to be sure to have a mix that didn't exclude 
other people in my life. And then again, I wanted things to be easy to obtain. If it was a, an esoteric flower that you could only get from a yak in Kathmandu, it wasn't helpful for anybody. So um, I came up with da -da, Jean's Gluten-Free All-Purpose Flour. And the recipe for this is in my book. It's on my site. Uh, and you can make it yourself. I don't sell it as a product. But what it has in it is brown, brown rice flour, white rice flour, sweet rice flour, tapioca flour, and xanthan gum. Um, and these are the things, what I did is I mixed this up and then I use it cup for cup in my baking. And I, I found this to be pretty satisfying. So people ask me about recipe development, like how do I go about doing, uh, pr creating my recipes. And one thing I found is that gluten-free baking is actually still a pretty new field. And so it's very exciting and you can be innovative. And what I really like is I get to investigate things and figure out what is actually going on with the, the flowers and the other ingredients and how do I mix all of these together to create a thing that I want to eat and that I want to share with other people. What I found that that I like to do is I like to start with the classics. So I like to start with, you know, cookies and bread and cakes and all of these things. But I also start with classic techniques. So I went back to basic, good classical baking. Um, one thing I found over the course of time is you, even if you adapt a recipe, so you take your flour and you use it on some recipe you found in, in another book, sometimes you need to ad adjust certain ingredients. So I found that, for example, most gluten-free things need more uh, a leavener, so like baking soda, baking powder, yeast. They also, it's good, I, I found that classic techniques are really helpful. So for example, beating the fat and the sugar, so the butter and the sugar together to create the air pockets that allow the leavener to work, that works really well for gluten-free baking. We've kind of forgotten that as wheat bakers. Um, often I have found that my readers need extra information. I get a lot of people who are coming to baking never having baked before. So when I write recipes, I need to make sure that someone who really doesn't know the kitchen very well is able to use them uh, and bake well. And then I also have to be aware of other substitutions. How many people here are not only gluten intolerant, but are intolerant to other things, dairy, eggs, nuts. So, wow, that's unusual. Usually I get a lot of folks who are also intolerant to other things. And so in my book and in my recipes, I'm always trying to give people different um, substitutions for the common things. So for the dairy and the eggs in particular. And then often, uh, you know, like I try to make my recipes so they don't hinge on nuts, so they can keep the nuts in or out if they want to. OK, so I have a blog. I don't know if anyone goes to my blog. But on my blog, it's called Art of Gluten-Free Baking. And I share recipes. I share baking tips. I, share, I interact with my readers. And I get feedback from them about what they want. Um, I answer questions. And I also teach folks a little bit about baking, how to maneuver this world called gluten-free living. Uh, I try to make it a place that is helpful and friendly and that people feel like they can come to and get some information from. And it's been really satisfying for me. One thing that I have in my um, past is I'm a, I have a PhD in theater history. And so this really touches my teaching side. I haven't been a professor for a long time, but it's very helpful to kind of have this venue that I can um, interact with people and teach. So I have recipe principles. I don't know if these are interesting to people or not. But one thing I've learned is that you, I kind of, it's important for me to follow a list of um, things that helps ground me and when, when I'm developing recipes. So I like to learn from the past. And one thing I always keep in mind is even though everyone today, I don't know, buys puff pastry from the, the supermarket, I can't buy puff pastry. So I have to make it myself. And I keep realizing that a long time ago, there was no such thing as a supermarket or the, you know, the frozen food section. So they had to make everything. So whenever something feels almost impossible to make, I think, no, at one point in history, that was made by human beings, and I can do that. So I, there's nothing I found that I can't mimic 
other than San Francisco sourdough. I do have a sourdough recipe on my site, but I don't have San Francisco sourdough because as you know, that needs a particular yeast and on and on. Uh, the other thing, uh, again, I, I use classic baking techniques. I always try to go back to the basics uh, if things aren't working out. I try to think outside of the box. This is really important because sometimes people get stuck in doing things the way they've always been done. So for example, I make a, a gluten-free potato gnocchi, you know, the little dumplings, and they were not behaving well when I tried to boil them in water, and after several tries, I realized, okay, I need to cook these in a different way. Now, you can pan fry them, and they're delicious, but I still wanted to do the water cooking, and I realized that steaming them worked very well. So instead of putting them all the way in the water, I allowed the water to come to them to, to cook them. So I kind of, that was very helpful for me to, re, to remember, think outside the box. Don't do the things you always did necessarily. I also call pasta making humid baking. I don't know, that's goofy. But a lot of the same principles kind of apply to pasta making as apply to baking. I'm also open to new paradigms. So this is kind of, it's, it, has, it straddles two worlds. It's in, the, it's in classic baking, but it's also its, its own thing. And so you have to be open to completely new ways of doing things. And I found this with bread. I don't know if any, has anyone here made gluten-free bread before? So one thing about gluten-free bread is that you don't really need it because there's no gluten to develop in it, right? And my bread is more like a very thick cake batter. Now, a lot of people are getting stuck on the concept of kneading their gluten-free bread. But if you can get out of that and realize that you don't need to knead bread, it's more of a, a, a need to mix bread, then you have a lot more you can do with your bread. And so that's one thing, that's one, an example of I always try to keep things in perspective in that I need to not get stuck in old ways. And old ways are good if they work, but if they don't work, you need to move on. And I always refine my recipes. I mean, I'm not constantly changing them, but if, they, if I find different methods or different techniques or even different ingredients, sometimes I think, okay, I will refine this recipe, make it even better. And then my core idea, if it's not delicious, then it's not ready. I don't I try not to put recipes up on my site until they're done and until they're delicious. And one thing, just because I lost my ability to digest gluten doesn't mean I lost my ability to taste things. And I think a lot of people forget that about gluten-free people. So I don't um, settle. I want things to be just as excellent as they used to be for me. So I wrote a cookbook. Uh, it's here. Some of you have it. It's called Gluten-Free Recipes, uh, Gluten-Free Baking for the Holidays, 60 Recipes for Traditional Festive Treats. It's for the winter holiday season, so Thanksgiving, Hanukkah, Christmas, Kwanzaa, and New Year's. Um, it also it has recipes, but it also includes baking tips, and it includes ingredient and equipment info. So where to find ingredients, how to choose ingredients, um, how to choose equipment and where to find it. Um, I really had a lot of fun writing this book. Here's the cover, yay. Um, I was very lucky. I'm with Chronicle Books and they do just beautiful books and so um, I, I'm just thrilled with how my book came out. Um, one thing about the holiday time is that it's a time of community, and it's a time of traditions. And I have found that one thing gluten-free people need during the holidays is to be able to partake in the traditions and the festivities with everybody else. It's not that nice to go to Thanksgiving and be served like your own little plate that has like a piece of turkey on it, maybe some steamed green beans, and to be told, well, everything else has gluten, so that's your special plate. I want, it, I want to be part of it. I want to have the stuffing, I want to have the pie, I want to have the cookies, I want to have the dinner rolls, and I want to have them with everybody else. I don't want to have my yucky old dinner roll on the side. I want everyone to have delicious dinner rolls. And so gluten-free people feel this need to be part of the community pretty keenly. And uh, so I found that 
as a society, we use food to bring people together. So Thanksgiving is a really clear example, but you know, just things like potlucks and PTA bake sales and um, cocktail parties and birthday parties. We use the food in all of these things to bring the people together. And if you're leaving members of the community out, you're telling they're not part of the community. And it's very important to me to bring the people back in. Um, food reflects and reinforces traditions. And the holidays are full of traditions, as you know. So when I was first diagnosed in 2000, I thought, well, I'll just educate everyone about what I can eat and how to accommodate me, and then everyone will be happy having Thanksgiving without all of the stuff that they are, are used to because they'll, they'll include me and everyone will be happy. And I realized that's not that great of a strategy because people want to have the things they're used to and that are traditional, especially during the holidays. And so I have altered the way I approach gluten-free living and cooking and sharing and baking. And I just want to make things that are so good, nobody cares. That includes everybody. Everyone actually wants these things. They look forward to them during the year. And that my friends and family aren't sitting around thinking, oh, god, we got to share with Jean again. So, um, so that was the guiding tenet of my book. And yeah, so my cookbook, the theory is everyone it, it provides recipes for all the traditional elements of the holidays that everyone likes and everyone wants and that everyone can now eat because they're now gluten-free. Going forward, I am still doing a lot of development. I'm working on um, more ideas. Uh, there's a lot of uncharted territory to cover with gluten-free baking, which I think is really interesting. Again, it's baking but you've got to figure it out all over again, which is fascinating to me, and I really enjoy the challenge of it. Uh, I have a lot more to learn. Uh, I think everyone does. I'm trying to work on more difficult recipes, so things like croissants, artisan breads, like I said, some, some pastas, because a lot of pastas, it's hard to make them at home because of the cooking limitations. I'm also trying to learn more about my own intolerances. As I get older, I'm finding that I react not so great to dairy and not so great to eggs. I can still eat them, but I can't eat them the way I used to. So I'm trying, even though I've always done this, I'm re-upping my commitment to looking for excellent substitutions to give as options, not as the only thing, but to give as options in my books and on my site. And then I'm always trying to listen and learn from my readers. So listen to them and learn from them. Because I, I get so much information from my readers in terms of what's available out there, what's not available out there, what people want, what people uh, like. And so um, that's something I'm trying to always do. So um, where to find me? You can find me on my blog, uh, Art of Gluten-Free Baking. I'm also on Twitter as Four Chickens. My first blog was for chickens because I have chickens in my backyard and it was like a knitting blog and nobody read it, but whatever. So I switched it over to, to baking. Um, I'm also on Facebook as Art of Gluten-Free Baking and then I'm also, you, I have my email there. So you can find me in many different places. So what I would like to do is open it up for questions from folks or comments or ideas, whatever you guys have on your minds. I have an aunt who has been diagnosed with celiac disease. Um, I think we're trying to figure out if there's any genetic link to my sister who is starting, has always displayed symptoms that she mentioned. I'm wondering, do you feel first that your flour mixture is good for pizza dough? That's one thing that we have yet to find a good one. It um, is. I, I have a recipe on my site for pizza dough, and it's actually just naturally vegan. You don't need um, dairy or eggs in it, so it works for a lot of people. And I've also I have it for the regular baked in the oven and also grilled pizza. So if that's interesting. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my other question um, is kind of along the lines of the beginning of your talk. Um, I mentioned my sister's been displaying some symptoms, and it's pretty much cut it out. And we've learned that in order to get the official diagnosis, she actually would have to reintroduce it and go through the hell that is bringing it back into her life. Do you have any suggestions for somebody who's facing that? Is it best to just cut it out and say, what the heck? Or do you 
suggest going through the process to really know. If you don't know, in order to be diagnosed as celiac, you need to, it's a double um, uh, diagnosis process. You have to test uh, positive to a blood test, the gliadin antibodies test, and then you also have to have a bowel biopsy. Because one thing that the gluten is doing if you have celiac is it's um, flattening the villi in your lower intestine, and that causes people to not absorb things. So people who are celiac are often anemic, um, they're, they have osteoporosis, they're more inclined to different cancers, on top of the fact that they just feel gross. So the question is, do you go through the entire process, and in order to test well, uh, to, to accurately test, you need to be eating gluten? Now, if you figured out gluten makes you feel gross, and you stop eating gluten, and then a while later someone says, oh, would you like to test for that? You say yes, and they say, oh, by the way, you need to do three weeks of eating whole wheat bread. Now, for me, that wasn't an option. So what, here's the deal. There are, I, when I was tested, and this may be helpful for your sister, I tested positive to the blood test, and there are very few false positives for celiac. There are a lot of false negatives. Uh, but there are very few false negatives. And then the next step was I needed to undergo the bowel biopsy, and I declined the bowel biopsy. I, First of all, the test was positive, that was fine. But even more important, I didn't react well to gluten. I felt horrible when I ate gluten. So my answer is, it depends on if your sister will avoid gluten if, if a doctor doesn't tell her to do so. Does that make sense? So some people won't go off of gluten, even though they feel horrible every single time they eat it. But they will not go off gluten often if they are not given a diagnosis with these tests. So do you think your sister would, would officially go off of it if, if she didn't have the test? Then I would say no. She knows the deal. And um, you have it? You were diagnosed with it? No. Who was diagnosed? Nobody was. Oh, your aunt. OK. So there's a huge percentage rise. So if you have a, a, a close family member who has been diagnosed with celiac, there is some huge percentage of increased um, possibility that you will be diagnosed with gluten intolerance. So that's why we, di we, we always test our daughter. Because right now, she's not showing any symptoms of, of celiac, but you want to be sure that she never does. Uh, one thing I want to clarify is I technically, I guess, in some medical circles, am not celiac because I didn't undergo the bowel biopsy, which is interesting. So I tell people most of the time that I'm gluten intolerant. But I did test positive to the uh, blood test, uh, but I declined the biopsy, which is a thing. Now on top of it, I think I shared, I don't know if I shared with you, I, about four years ago I was diagnosed with a wheat allergy. And I am anaphylactic to wheat. So it doesn't really matter if I'm celiac or not, because if I eat wheat, I can die. Um, the last time I accidentally ate it, ate it I uh, landed in the hospital um, because I was undergoing anaphylaxis, and I had to get there quickly in order to be able to breathe. So, so that's a long answer to, to the thing. I don't know about other people, but I feel like if I feel gross when I eat something, I don't eat it anymore. But our society really isn't built like that. I know so many people who continue to eat the thing that makes them feel bad because they're so used to it and they like it. Or I have a friend who says, well, gluten makes me feel bad, so I only eat it on special occasions. And I think, so you go to a party and you eat it and you feel gross? That doesn't make a ton of sense to me. Like for them, that's a fun time. For me, that's not a fun time. But our society has such um, strong connections to food that have nothing to do with what it does to our bodies that people will do stuff like this. And this may even sound familiar to you or, or the people in your life. So. Just another question about uh, using your mix. Uh, do you use it for thickening, like in soups or things like that? Any I do. modifications you would make to it? No, uh -uh. I use it uh, tablespoon for tablespoon. And I use it for roux. I use it for bechamel. I use it for gravy. So I use it for all sorts of, of things. It seems to work really well for all of those things. I make a. Um, uh, 
uh, New Orleans uh, gumbo and I make the roux first and it performs beautifully. It turns that nice chocolate brown and it's really nice. So Super. Have yeah. you tried some of the other baking mixes, that are, flour mixes that are out there and do any of them compare? You know, I have. Um, I highly recommend the King Arthur mix. I don't know if anyone's used that one. That's a nice one. It, it's pretty reasonable. It, it has many of the same uh, ingredients that my mix has. I'm not sure if it has xanthan gum. So if it doesn't have xanthan gum, be sure to add a qu about a quarter teaspoon per cup uh, for your regular baking, not for yeasted breads. That's a whole different thing, but for regular baking. Um, we were talking earlier about cup for cup, which is the one that Thomas Keller has developed. You can, I think you can buy it in Williams-Sonoma. And cup for cup, I don't recommend First of all, I haven't used it, so I can't tell you how I like, if I like how it works, but it's got milk powder in it. And so many people I know who are gluten intolerant also can't do very, don't do that well with dairy, so I figure why even add that into the, into the situation. It sounds like you have a lot of great recipes that aren't just baking. Are you going to write another cookbook with your pizza and gnocchi and other you know, great things? You know, I hope to. That is something that's in the works. So yeah, I hope to do that. And I have all of these things on my site as well. So I've got the pizza on my site. I've got puff pastry on my site. I've got pasta dough on my site. Oh, and <clears throat> I guess the end. There you go. <laughs> But yeah, I have a ton of stuff on my site that um, are all, it's all free. And I also answer questions. So people often will write me and say, my fa this is my family's special recipe for German coffee cake and would you be willing to adapt it? And if I have the time and I want to, I, I will do that for folks. Um, you know, I mean, if I become super duper popular, I, I don't know how much I can do that. But I, that's part of what I, uh, earlier this year, I, I wanted to define for myself what my goal was with all of this. I mean, my first goal, of course, was for me. I wanted to be able to eat these things. But my second goal is to serve people, to help folks be able to eat again and to be able to bake again and be able to enjoy this again. And so I want to really continue that. And, and that's why I try to be as accessible as I can on social media and on my site, because I really want to help out folks. So. More of a, a curiosity. I noticed that in your in your recipe for the flour, one of the ingredients is glutinous rice flour, which I assume does not have gluten. No. But uh, is it just a lot of starch, or what makes it glutinous? Yeah, it's it has a lot of starch. It's it's also known as sticky rice flour, and the glutinous part, as you picked up, it just means it's sticky. Uh, it's called sweet rice flour most of the time. Uh, you can buy it in the supermarket often in the ethnic section in a little white box that's labeled mochiko. Um, and it's, it's used a lot in Asian baking. But it is confusing. I get tons of questions about, you're gluten-free and yet you use glutinous rice flour. And so I have to explain that rice is not a gluten-containing grain. So it's just a weird name. I don't know why. <laughs> but, but it actually is a really good part of the mix. It really in addition to the xanthan gum, it helps bring things together, which I think is nice. Um, another thing about my, just talking about my mix, I recommend to folks, you'll, you see this in my book and I have it on my site, but I recommend that you, if you are sensitive to graininess, this is one of the issues that often happens with gluten-free flour, always look for the finely ground uh, flours. So like there's extra fine grind, brown rice flour that you can find. Now, if you, find, if you can't find it and you're just using brown rice flour, like I use the flours from Bob's Red Mill. I use flours from Authentic Foods. And these two, Authentic Foods has the extra fine grind, but Bob's doesn't. And if it bothers you enough, you can just stick it in your blender or your food processor and grind it up a little more and make it a little more fine. So that works too. Um, the one, I would not recommend in terms of the mix, you asked about mix, the Bob's Red Mill mix is not so good. Do you guys have Bob's Red Mill here? Yeah, yeah okay. Uh, it has a lot of bean flour in it and it's just very strong tasting. And I don't know why they keep having it that, but when you make things, so when part of when I bake, like I bake cookies, I eat some of the cookie dough. That's just kind of part of what I do. You cannot do that when it, there's a bean flour involved because it's so strong and it's so, Yucky, basically. So, 
that's why I recommend stay away from the bean flowers. Also, the bean flowers are very uh, high in protein and they go rancid very quickly. So you need to store those in the freezer usually. So, and I, I have that in my book and on my site, but something to keep in mind. So, did that answer your question about the glutinous rice? <laughs> so, more questions? Uh, so you mentioned you have people ask you to adapt lots of recipes. Um, when you're doing that adapt adaptation, uh, what would you say is the most common change you're making? Well, the flour, of course. Um, the other, probably the two most common changes I make is in terms of the leavener. So often things don't have enough leavening. And when I say leavener, I mean the thing that makes it rise. So baking powder, baking soda yeast. So most gluten-free recipes I've found need more of those things often. Um, now using classic baking techniques actually sometimes makes it so you don't have to because you're, you're creating the air pockets that the leaveners can work on when, for example, you beat the fat and the, and the uh, sugar together. But um, so it's the leaveners that I often do. Sometimes eggs, I find that there's not enough eggs in baking uh, to create the moisture and also to create some of the structure. And then with yeast, uh, you need to have much more yeast than you would normally have. Those are the probably the, the most common changes I make. Um, oh, and the other thing is gluten-free things seem to take a little bit longer to cook, to bake. So I often either increase the temperature or I, at least I increase the time. And I think part of that is, is my, so do you guys know the concept of hydration? So um, in baking parlance, the um, hydration of a dough is the percentage of the, the water or liquid in a dough. And I have found that gluten-free things do well with more liquid in it, more water, because um, they dry out much more quickly. And I think that then leads to a longer baking time, uh, because you need to, to bake some of that out. So is that helpful? There's one thing that's hard is I try to tell people, for example, if you have a cookie recipe and you want to adapt it, I just tell people, use my mix, use it cup for cup for the wheat flour in your recipe, see what happens. And for something like a cookie, that usually suffices. Uh, then you get a little more complicated. You get into muffins and scones. And Sometimes you need tweaks, sometimes you don't. Get into cakes, that's a little more complicated. But I always tell people to try and see what happens. And then once they see what happens, if it's not to their liking, they can kind of reverse engineer what happened. So was it too dry? OK, it's too dry. Add more eggs or add more liquid. Didn't rise. OK, did you beat the eggs, the fat, and the sugar? Yes, OK, you need more leavener. Um, it's that, it, did it come out kind of um, wet after you baked it? Yes, OK, you need to raise the baking temperature, and you need to put it in longer. So I, I think I ultimately would like to get to the point where I can teach people to do this themselves. But each recipe seems to be its own bird. And so, so far, I haven't been able to say, for all muffins, you need to make this adaptation. You know, that kind of thing. So that's what makes it complicated. But I tell people to try and see what happens. The one thing you can't adapt cup for cup at all is a yeasted recipe. Yeasted recipes are their whole, whole other bird. You need more yeast. You need more liquid. Often you need more eggs. You need more time. And so when people try to do, for example, they try to do their mom's bread with my um, flour mixture, it doesn't work so well because there's so many different variables that go into a yeasted thing. So that's a challenge. Um, although, like I said, I do have a sourdough on my site, which is fun because you develop your own sourdough starter and then from there you make the bread, which is a fun, if you like that kind of thing, it's a fun process. And I harvest the wild yeast. Uh, I don't use commercial yeast, I harvest wild yeast and I show you how to do that. So that's kind of fun. So a lot of the gluten-free baking I do is for somebody who is also rice intolerant, and I encounter that a lot in the recipes in your right. mix. Um, so any suggestions for a direction to go if rice flour is not really an option? Yes. I, in my book, if you've got the book, I've got some um, substitutions, like for, with, for the, so I don't think I can remember all of them. I have it on my site, but I think it's for the, now this will alter my mix and things will 
behave and taste a little different. But for the brown rice flour, I tell you to substitute sorghum. For the white rice flour, I tell you to substitute millet flour. For the sweet rice flour, I tell you to substitute potato flour. For the tapioca flour, you substitute potato starch, two different things, and then you use the xanthan gum. So you're gonna have a different tasting mix. It's gonna be a little more flavorful because millet and sorghum taste has a taste. Also, you may wanna grind the sorghum because sorghum tends to be a little gritty, and the millet too, kinda depends. Um, also, be aware that the starches, weirdly enough, even tapioca starch will go bad way quicker than you think they do. And I don't really understand why. A lot of people tell me they don't like tapioca starch. Now the weird thing, tapioca starch and tapioca flour, same thing. Potato starch and potato flour, not the same thing. So it's really complicated. But what I have found is starches tend to go very rancid very quickly. And people who tell me they don't like tapioca flour, often it's they don't like rancid tapioca flour. If it tastes metallic and disgusting, it's gone bad. So if, you, if that, and that, uh, I think what I want to tell you is if the potato starch is tasting funky, then to, to switch that out. So any of these flours, if you're not using them quickly, I recommend you store them in the fridge or you store them in the freezer just to make sure um, that you're not running into the going bad thing. <laughs> you know, I, I had a fabulous photographer and she made things well, they look like this, but she also just brought out how good they taste. So I'm quite lucky to have had her. Um, I, I really enjoyed the whole process of writing this book. It was fun and delicious. I spent most of 2011 in Christmas land, so, which is not a bad place to be, really. You know. Oh, one thing I have in my book, I, just as a little teaser, I've got fortune cookies in the book. So if you're gluten-free and you haven't had a fortune cookie in a long time, you can have fortune cookies. That's always fun. I have fruit cake, plum pudding, pies, dinner rolls, cookies. So thank you very much for having me. It's been an honor and it's been a lot of fun. I appreciate it.